Hello, everybody. Um, it's Al Hewer here, um, Terry's partner in A&T Lectures, um, also uh, a professor at Rutgers University and uh, adjunct professor in respiratory care at both Rush University in Chicago and um, County College of Morris, uh, locally here in New Jersey, in New Jersey. I edit several textbooks, including Egan's Fundamentals of Respiratory Care and the Comprehensive Respiratory Therapy Exam Preparation Guide. That second text that I met mentioned um, is not specific to the pulmonary function testing uh, exams, but rather have chapters in them that really you know, talk to those issues. So um, let's take a look at some of the um, learning objectives. But before we do that, I wanna, I wanna make one thing clear. Um, I recently became a um, item writer for the MBRC, for the National uh, Board of Respiratory Care. Um, I actually, the first batch that they gave me to write uh, related to the RPFT exam, ironically. Uh, and they were they were a bear to write for reasons I'm not going to really go into right now. But it wasn't so much the interpretation; it was a lot of the QA, QI, you know, a quality improvement, quality assurance. It was you know a calibration, things along those lines. Quite frankly, topics that I find kind of boring. But I guess they were putting my my feet to the fire. Um, so I wrote some some questions on that. I recently wrote some questions for the TMC, the multiple choice exam, um, for the you know the entry level uh, candidates. Uh, my disclaimer goes like this, you know, though I've become an item writer from the MBRC, I have not prepared this presentation with any restricted um, uh, material from the MBRC. Information presented um, <clears throat> from the MBRC, it's publicly available from the website. Um, and again, I did not use any of the questions that I submitted to them, didn't use anything that was really close to it, but did use questions that I know um, are uh, similar to those that will appear on both the C and the RPFT exams. So some of the learning objectives we're going to look at, maybe the learning objectives are obvious if we're really talking about, you know, test taking strategies um, and specifically those related to the, the R and CPFT. Um, but but I, I believe in just being a little bit more specific regarding these objectives. They go like this. Well, we're going to examine the rationale for pursuing the CPFT and the RPFT. So that that's a little different than the actual rationale for doing PFTs. It has to do with your, uh, you know, your motivation um, as professionals to, to potentially seek these credentials. Maybe some of you already are. So this may just be filling some of the gaps, you know, refreshing, you know, uh, some of the information that that's in your memory banks, but maybe you haven't used in a while. We'll review uh, key resources available from the MBRC. We'll examine sample questions and again, sample um, similar questions that you'd find in these exams. Describe how to prepare for the exam, review some test taking strategies, and provide you guys with additional resources um, if you want to drill down uh, more on, on this topic. So why seek the, the R and the CPFT credential? You know, knowledge is a, is a wonderful thing. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer that, you know, whether it's knowledge on uh, ventilator patient management, whether it's knowledge on you know, things like uh, the, the latest uh, pharmacological interventions or the, the latest on hemodynamic monitoring. Um, it just, it, it can make you a, a better clinician. Um, it's better for patient care because your knowledge base is greater. It also garners respect um, from other disciplines. Um, when these other disciplines, uh, physicians, nurses, your peer respiratory therapists and, and your other allied health co uh, colleagues, um, it, when, when, when you're participating in rounds, you're sharing your knowledge as you understand it. Um, it, it, it empowers you and it empowers our profession as well. And again, makes us better clinicians and um, you know, a, a better able to take care of patients in the most safe and effective way. Knowledge can be obtained through education and credentials. So you guys are, I see you're gaining knowledge. So, some of this stuff you probably knew, uh, maybe it's just reinforcement and some of it may be more novel. Uh, so, so again, by, uh, you know, uh, uh, obtaining your CEUs, um, attending sessions like this, um, even taking it to the next step, such as, um, you know, some of our colleagues have actually uh, furnished you guys with additional resources if you want to drill down more, you know, by doing that on, on your own. Um, and some of the, the RMPFT material can be, um, can be a bit dry, quite honestly. Uh, particularly, again, when you talk about the, the quality assurance, you talk about, um, you know, your calibrations and things along those lines, um, it can be a bit dry. Uh, but that's what the MBRC expects. They expect you to know the glamorous stuff, the how to do the procedure, 
and you know how to interpret it. Uh, and that, that's glamorous, but it's certainly a very important thing to be able to do. They also expect you to be able to maintain the equipment, know when you have a valid test and things along those lines. So again, those things are going to empower you as well. What can also happen if you actually seek these, these, these additional credentials is you're going to have more career opportunities. You know, they could be expanded. You can consider, you know, um, you know, I, I, I love acute care, but, you know, being in the ICU for three or four 12 hour shifts, um, you know, a, a week, uh, it can be wearing. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my sixties guys. And, you know, again, I enjoy when I say blood and guts, I don't enjoy just seeing anybody in pain, but I enjoy, you know, being in that acute care setting. Um, but you're not going to be doing it the whole time and, you know, being able to, you know, if you will transfer some of that knowledge into a less acute setting where you're still adding a lot of value can also be great as well. So just to, again, at the risk of stating the obvious, MBRC, I've listed the URL here. We're not going to you know, delve there now, but when you go to the MBRC uh, website, you can navigate. They have a lot of tabs, um, but you navigate to the, you know, the C and the RPFT. I deliberately picked a screenshot of the RPFT uh, because I'm, I'm hoping that you guys will, you know, eventually um, pursue that and, and, and obtain that, uh, that credential. Um, but, you know, you, you, you select that tab, you obviously get this screen here, and then you can actually apply for it. Um, by, by selecting in that, uh, you know, lower um, left-hand side there, apply for the examination now. But then they also will give you, look at the very bottom there, they'll, they'll give you an idea of the, the scoring. And I have a screenshot in the next slide that talks about, you know, the, the actual exam matrix. Um, the admission requirements, they'll give you a free practice exam with, you know, again, sample questions, uh, self-assessment, general exam information, um, frequently uh, asked questions, and then they sometimes they'll have these yeah, these these vouchers where they'll they'll give a you know a, a discount if you will. When I took the ACCS exam, don't ask me why, but uh, for some reason there there was a discount at that time. It was a sale. They were running a sale on the ACCS exam. Um, I took the ACCS exam um, about three and a half years ago, and I will tell you, you know, I'm an old timer, so it was the first. Um, computerized exam, credential exam I had taken from the MBRC. And not only did I go to the MBRC website before I took the exam for information like this, but I also went there because it would give you a, a you know, sample screen, what to expect, where things are located, you know, how to save a question and things along those lines. So if you haven't taken one of those exams in a while, um, you know, going to the MBRC website can pay a lot of dividends in many ways, in many ways. A screenshot from from the first page of the um, you know the RPFT uh, exam matrix, and again this is not you know uh, complete by any stretch of the imagination, but you can see that it just gives you an idea of some of the topics that are on it. Um, again, uh, there typically there are uh, facets of the exam that individuals will find you know easier or harder. Um, it's just the reality of things. And um, in the case of the CNRPFT, interpreting the results can be challenging, particularly from some of the more, the mixed and some of the more subtle, um, if you will, abnormalities. Um, so, you know, interpreting the results and interpreting, you know, a, a, you know, again, across the board, some of the obvious ones you'll absolutely get on the exam, some of the less obvious ones you'll get as well. Parameters for what, what is an acceptable result or a series of results. The ATS parameters for test acceptability, quality control, and things along those lines can be a bit more elusive. I will tell you, when I took the RPFT many, many moons ago, um, I actually found it the most difficult exam, you know, the, the most ex difficult uh, credentialing exam uh, from the MBRC, with, without, without doubt. So let's take a look at some questions here. So kind of building on that theme of, uh, of questions, um, and um, I'm looking, looking at my animations. So it looks like they actually work here. Um, what I don't fully have the ability to do is to um, look at this and look at my chat simultaneously because it'll kind of blur some of the some of my screen here. Um, so kind of bear with me. You're welcome to kind of weigh in. I will give you time to answer the question, but this isn't just question answer. I am also going to share with you the actual explanation. Um, often, certainly, why the correct answer is correct and often why the other answers are not the best answer. Speaking of which, 
Um, the MBRC is, um, you know, they're, they're funny. You know, it's like not, 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 not funny like uh, Joe Pesci in Goodfellas, but, you know, they're, they're, they're a little bit funny in that sometimes they will give you two answers that are correct, but they want you to select the best answer. Okay, they want you to select the best answer. So some of these explanations will will talk to that issue of why you know the answer is the best answer. So let's let's take a let's take a look. Question is, patient has a peak uh, expiratory flow rate of 5.2 second uh, liters per second before bronchodilator treatment and 6.3 after the treatment. What is the percent change for the peak flow? What 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 is it that has occurred? Choices. Eight percent is A, B is 17 percent, C is 21 percent, and D is 26 percent. So again, I'm not going to rush into it too quickly. I'm going to give you a moment to do a little bit of math. And if you don't feel like doing the math or, you know, you just, you just want to verify that your answer is correct, we're going to go there in a moment, I promise. So the correct answer is C, but the key is why is it correct? Basic calculation. So the explanation is the calculation for percent change is the pre minus the post. So in this case, the pre, the 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 uh, five point two minus the six point three. You're actually going to take the absolute value of that. So it's obviously one point one over the pre. So it's one point one over five point two. Let's see what that actually equates to. So six point three over five point minus five point two over five point two times 100. So again, you end up with 1.1 1 .1 over 5.2. When you do that math, when you do that division, it ends up being 21%. I don't think you'd get a ton of questions exactly like this. It's kind of a layup. If you're okay with the math, it's kind of a layup. But I suspect one or two, um, if you were to sit for either the C or the RPFT, particularly the CPFT. Question two, a doctor asks you to provide Serial, meaning a series of measurements of respiratory muscle strength of a patient with progressive acute neuromuscular disease or a disorder. Which of the following measures would you select to provide this needed information? A, a forced vital capacity. B, arterial blood gas results, C, a RSBI or rapid shallow breathing index, and D, MVV or maximum vol voluntary ventilation. I'm deliberately just giving you a moment to digest all this. And let's take a look at the answer. The correct answer is A, forced vital capacity. As significant, let's look at why. Of the measures listed, so things like NIF, NIF's not there, okay? Only the forced vital capacity provides information primarily on the patient's respiratory muscle strength. Since the forced vital capacity includes both maximum inspiratory and expiratory effort, it provides an overall picture of the strength of both of these sets of muscles the, on the inspiratory side and the expiratory side. Were separate information needed on either inspiratory or expiratory muscle alone, a maximum inspiratory pressure or MIP, NIF, same difference, or maximum expiratory pressure, a MEP, could have been measured instead. But that wasn't the question. The question wasn't separate measurements. It was, you know, looking at your neuromuscular patient and looking at their, their respiratory muscle strength. Question three, and in total, we'll go over about 20 questions and then we'll kind of go over some more, uh, you know, preparing for the exam, particularly useful for those maybe who haven't um, taken exams in a while, whether it be for an academic course or for, you know, credentialing uh, a type of purpose. After bedside measurement, you note that a patient's slow and forced vital capacity are approximately equal and both 
or less than 60% of predicted value. Which of the following diagnosis is least likely? Least likely. Lung resection. Interstitial fibrosis is B. C, myasthenia gravis. And D, COPD. Again, deliberately taking a moment here, taking a knee. The answer is D. Again, as significant as the answer is the explanation. Let's take a look at it. If the slow vital capacity is low, a restrictive disorder is likely present, such as interstitial fibrosis, lung resection, again, talking to some of the other alternative uh, answers here. Um, consolidative process such as pneumonia, CHF, obesity, neuromuscular disorders such as myasthenia gravis. Again, also a choice here. In these patients, the slow vital capacity and the forced vital capacity will not usually differ significantly. Okay, will not. Remember, this question is, which of the following diagnosis is least likely? However, if the FVC is substantially less than the slow vital capacity, air trapping is likely present, signifying obstructive lung disease. So just to kind of elaborate a little more than the actual explanation itself. So picture a patient that has COPD, and let's be more specific and say emphysema. So they have lost, their lungs have lost elastance, elastance. And in, in most cases, they tend to have more difficulty exhaling, okay, exhaling than inhaling. Okay, has to do with what we learned about the equal pressure point, but ultimately comes down to the loss of elastance. They have saggy lungs. They have a very high compliance, okay? So coming back to the question, we're delineating, you know, a, a fast and a slow vital capacity. If you give a patient who has a, a, an obstructive disorder like emphysema enough time to exhale, you do a slow vital capacity, they're probably going to get a lot more out than doing so in a forced manner. And that's really what this comes, comes down to. So you just gotta read these questions carefully. So again, the last part of the explanation, if the forced vital capacity is substantially less than the slow vital capacity, okay, air trapping is like, likely present because those patients, again, tend to have more difficulty exhaling than inhaling. Question four. As compared to predicted normals, a patient has a normal FEV1 percentage, a normal FEF2575, but, but a markedly reduced force vital capacity. The test results are repeatable. So we're not reading anything in that there's something wacky with the test results. Which of the following it is the most likely underlying problem? Let's take a look at our choices. A poor patient effort during the test procedure. Okay. Plausible, in this case, I'm just saying, you know, if, if you're looking at something, you know, a particular test, and they're giving you a depiction where you can confirm, no, it's a poor uh, patient effort, then go with it. If not, it's probably a distractor. It's probably not the right, the right answer. B, a restrictive disorder of the lungs or chest wall. C, combined, restrictive and obstructive disease. And D, peripheral or small airway obstruction. Give you a moment. Correct the answer is B, but as important, let's look at why. In the presence of normal expiratory flow parameters, FEV1 percentage, FEF2575. A reduced force vital capacity indicates or at least suggests a restrict, restrictive disorder of the lungs or the chest wall. Again, a reduced forced vital capacity. So capacity to be extra volume, you have stiff lungs and or chest wall, your flows 
will tend to be normal or in some cases, in some cases, even super normal, a little bit high, okay? But the volumes tend to be diminished. That would be your classic distinction uh, if there's such a thing between an obstructive and a, res a restrictive disorder. Question five. As measured by, by the single breath DLCL, so uh, other presentations that have been given, we delve into this. The diffusing capacity of the lungs would be decreased in which one, which one of the following cases? Pulmonary hypertension, A. B, secondary polycythemia. C, strenuous exercise. And D, pulmonary emphysema. So think about these for a minute. Think about pulmonary hypertension. Does that seem like it, it would it would bear some influence on DLCL? That's A. B. Secondary polycythemia. It's a lot of red blood cells relative to volume. And when we're talking about secondary polycythemia, it's probably due to chronic hypoxemia that we see with chronic lung disease. And believe it or not, you see it at high altitude dwellers, real high. The ones that live in the Himalaya, things along those lines. Uh, the, the Sherpas that climb Mount Everest, they're all polycythemic. It's a, a compensatory mechanism. Strenuous exercise. And D, pulmonary emphysema. Let's take a gander. The answer is D, pulmonary emphysema. DLCO is low in conditions that actually impair membrane diffusion, the alveolar capillary membrane, such as in pulmonary fibrosis or decreased surface area as in emphysema, okay? Emphysema does result in um, an insult to the alveolar capillary membrane as well. So what you will often see, particularly with clinically significant emphysema, you know, moderate to severe em uh, emphysema, you will see a diminishment in the DLCO. Just go on with the explanation here. The DLCO can also be less than normal with reduced hemoglobin, anemia. There's less buses, there's less red blood cells for the, uh, you know, for the oxygen to bind to, you know, simply put. Um, decreased uh, pulmonary capillary blood flow for similar reasons. It's not that they're anemic, it's just that there's reduced blood flow or decreased alveolar volume. Increases, increases in DLCO occur with increased hemoglobin as in secondary polycythemia, increased pulmonary blood flow, as you can see with exercise, increased alveolar volume and during exercise. So again, the correct answer is D as in David. Question six, in reviewing a patient's chart, you note a history of COPD and a BMI or body mass index of 15. It's low. So it's associated with somebody who's skinny. Yeah, just simply put. Which of the following tests would you recommend? Polysomnograph or polysomnography, an exercise stress test, a metabolic study, or a bronch, bronchoscopy. Correct answer is C. What if we have metabolic heart? Okay, they can do it on patients that are spontaneously breathing, or they can do it on patients that, that are mechanically ventilated. Um, let's take a let's take a closer look here. So with a BMI of 15, this patient is severely malnourished. May, may be malnourished from a micronutrient perspective. So vitamins, minerals, you know, electrolytes, things along those lines, but is certainly malnourished when it comes to macronutrients, so total calories and things along those lines. That alone is an indication for measurement of the metabolic parameters. VO, uh, VO2, so that's oxygen uptake, VCO2, so you know th things like uh, CO2 production, um, you know, RE, resting energy expenditures and the like via indirect calorimetry, which is often done by the PFT team. Add to that COPD in which the O2 cost of breathing can be prohibitive, can be very high and excessive carbohydrates can increase ventilatory demand and basically increase CO2 production when those carbohydrates are broken down. The, and the need for metabolic assessment, it seems apparent. Everything seems apparent if you know it. Okay, granted. 
other clinical situations in which the, the um, again, the IC studies may be indicated include severe sepsis, multiple trauma, burns, hyper or hypometabolic states, chronical ventilation, weaning difficulties, and whenever a patient's response to nutritional support is inadequate. Just to be clear on something, without, without a doubt, a patient, if a patient is malnourished, macro and or micronutrients, and they're on a ventilator, it can absolutely interfere with their wean ability. So in this particular case, this metabolic study and this individual, they're not mechanically ventilated yet or at all type of deal, but they really want to get to the bottom of it um, and find out what kind of a, you know, a, a dietary regimen that they can be put on um, in order to, number one, get their BMI a higher, but also give them the right blend of a probably, pro, you know, more protein rich. It may actually have some fats in it because fat, fat uh, you know, contains um, you know, requires more uh, kilocalories to burn it up. Um, and this individual may actually need that, but really lower, lower on carbohydrates because when carbohydrates are broken down um, alone, that can result in an increased uh, a CO2 production. Which of the following tests would you recommend in order to identify the cause of dyspnea and factors limiting a patient's exercise tolerance? So the patient comes in, they're, they, don't, they, they can't, they're climbing stairs, they can't climb them like they used to. Um, they've done an EKG, they've done cardiac enzymes. It doesn't look like it's a, you know, it wasn't an MI, it's not, it's not ischemia, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not that. They've eliminated some of the other things, but they re require secondary testing to get to the bottom of it. Okay, so let's take a look at what our choices are. Six minute walk or walking test or distance. B, overnight oximetry assessment. Remember, they're asking for the best answer. C, peak expiratory flow rate, peak flow. And D, comprehensive exercise testing or exercise stress testing. Take a moment. The answer is D, to identify, to identify the cause of dyspnea and factors limiting a patient's exercise tolerance you would need to conduct a comprehensive cardiopulmonary exercise stress test or exercise test. Really going to give you a lot of you know, good in, in information regarding whether or not the patient's limitation to exercise is cardiac in nature, is pulmonary in nature. Um, again, if, if those are eliminated, maybe it's orthopedic in nature. Um, and in other cases of, of disability testing, it may be a patient who's a malingerer. So they're claiming they had a particular exposure. They're claiming now they have, you know, intolerance to any sort of uh, stress or exercise. Um, they're looking for disability and you do this additional testing and really find that, you know, there's no logical reason why this individual um, is, is, you know, unable to perform this test. Um, that's more rare. More, more likely, it really gives the, cl the clinical team an idea of what that limitation is. Is it cardiac? Is it pulmonary? Is it combined? And then from there, you know, where do we go from there? So again, the to identify the cause of dyspnea, limiting factors, exercise, you know, you would need to conduct the, the exercise stress test. The six minute walk test, uh, you know, on, on the contrary, um, only evaluates how well the body as a whole responds to exertion. And really, when I say it's simple, it's how, how far can the patient walk in six minutes? Whether they, even if they need to sit down, you continue to stop watching the six minutes and how far they can actually be able to, um, to walk. And really can be, you know, six minute walk test can be very helpful. Like a patient participated in pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, you know, so they, they took this, they did the six minute walk test, um, both, you know, before and after and after participating in pulmonary rehabilitation. Among other things, among other things, the patient has much better results in the six minute walk test. Basically, they can walk much further. Correct answer here again is D, compre comprehensive exercise stress test or exercise test. Question eight, a friend of pulmonologist asks us or you to assess 
airway responsiveness during a pulmonary function exam. He wants to rule out asthma from chronic bronchitis. So, you know, is it, is it one, is it the other, is it combined in a patient complaining of nocturnal wheezing? Which of the following tests or tests would you recommend? A bronchial provocation test. Bronchial provocation involves, uh, you know, again, some of our other speakers have alluded to this, but, but it involves the administration of very low doses of methacholine, which is a cholinergic substance. Think about atrovin is anticholinergic. Well, you have a, a methacholine is a cholinergic, and they start with low doses and increase it in a stepwise fashion. And if the patient has a you know a reactive airway or asthma, um, they'll become bronchospastic at, at a particular point. So A is bronchial provocation. <clears throat> B is cardiopulmonary stress test. C is nitrogen washout. And D is thoracic gas volume. So without tipping my hand, I mean, everything's obvious if you, if you know it, but um, there's a couple of answers here that are outliers that I almost could be eliminated or at least discounted significantly. So let's, let's look at the correct answer. Correct answer is A, okay? And I just gave you kind of a, I probably tipped my own hand a little bit and gave you guys a bit of an explanation. Uh, you know, regarding the, um, you know, what the bronchial provocation test involves. For those of you who maybe were less aware, let's look at the why. Tests that are indicated to assess for the presence or absence and the degree of airway responsiveness include bronchi bronchial provocation, methacholine, histamine challenge, and expired nitric oxide, not inhaled, expired nitric oxide. Again, nitric oxide, we absolutely will give it to our patients in ARDS, our, some of our heart patients, et cetera. Um, that's because it's actually produced endogenously within your body. Um, what we also know about nitric oxide is, is when you measure what's produced endogenously, it tends to increase uh, dr uh, dramatically when the patient is um, experiencing a bronchospasm, um, whether it's due to bronchial provocation or just due to their underlying condition. They are also indicated to screen individuals who may be at risk for environmental or occupational exposure to allergens. So again, correct answer is A, bronchial provocation. Question nine, which of the following is, is the best test for assessing degree of reversible bronchospasm in an asthmatic patient? A, nitrogen washout. B, spirometry before and after bronchodilation. C, MVV, or maximum voluntary ven ventilation, and D, maximum inspiratory and expiratory force. Let's take a look. Correct answer is B, as in boy. Explanation goes like this. The only test that will give you a picture of how well a bronchodilator treatment works is force vital capacity spirometry before and after bronchodilation. The books vary a little bit on, well, what's significant? An increase of at least 12 to 15% in the FEV1 after bronchodilator use, as a, is often used as a, a threshold to indicate reversibility, right? There's kind of a caveat. I've seen books say as high as 20%. If you use in that range of like 15%, you should be fine. The MBRC is probably not going to, oh, they gave you 16% or they gave you, you know, 11%. They're probably not going to do that to you. They're going to give you a number that is, you know, it's going to, it'll, it'll be somewhat or readily apparent um, what that percent change actually is. Question 10, which of the following would provide the best bedside assessment of the need for ventilatory assistance in a patient with myasthenia gravis. Remember, myasthenia gravis, um, it's episodic, tends to start kind of, you know, in the central part of the body and work its way out, which is kind of unfortunate because starting in the central part of the body will affect respiratory muscles, et cetera. Uh, episodic, it can be controlled. Often these patients are on um, different uh, medications like uh, uh, mestinon in order to keep it um, in abeyance. Um, so without further ado at, um, on myasthenia, let's take a look at these choices here. A, A, functional residual capacity. 
B, vital capacity. C, closing volume. And D, total lung capacity. You're thinking about your, your, your uh, muscle weakness patients. It could be Duchenne's. Okay, that, that's pretty much a, a, a progressing um, disease. So it gets worse. Uh, myasthenia can undulate. There's different forms of it, but it, the patients can get worse and then they get better, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's, let's take a look. Correct answer is B, vital capacity. So again, vital capacity NIF, um, those can be particularly useful with your neuromuscular patients. That's not all you'll do, but it can be useful. You can even do in some of these patients, what they'll even do is they'll do the uh, non-invasive uh, end tidal CO2. Uh, and maybe they'll couple it with, with this as well. But let's take a look at why B is. So myasthenia gravis is, of course, a neuromuscular disease that affects muscle strength. And again, really starting at the core and working its way uh, out and down. Of the tests listed, the vital capacity requires the most muscular effort from the patient and would be the first of the listed tests to decrease in a neuro, neuromuscular disorder or disease. Question 11, according to ATS recommendations, diagnostic spirometer, spirometers should be calibrated to within which of the following? Folks, this is the stuff that I kind of found boring. I don't work in a PFT lab. I'm not making fun of people that do. I, they, they provide a, a great service, a great value, plus pulmonary function tests are billable. A lot of things that respiratory therapists do, whether it's in the unit, you know, whether it's, you know, assisting with an intubation, ventilator patient management, there, a lot of that stuff is not individually charged. There's not an ICD-10 code for that, okay? For pulmonary function testing, there is, all right? So I'm a fan, not just because of that, because that gives you some very valuable information. Of course, you're not going to make a diagnosis strictly based on pulmonary function testing, but it certainly can give you a lot of insight looking at the patient's chart or assessing the patient hands-on. Um, and doing this pulmonary function testing can give you a lot of, of good uh, information. So A, plus or minus 1% or, or 10 mLs. B, plus or minus 3% or 50 mLs. C, plus or minus 5% or 100 mLs. And D, 10%, uh, plus or minus 10% and 500 mLs, whichever greater. Correct answer. Answer is B. And this is the ATS recommendations for diagnostic spirometers. Calibration checks should be within plus or minus 3% or 50 mLs, whichever is larger. That's something that, you know, if you take the exam, this sort of material, you're just going to have to study and memorize. Uh, and again, if, the, if it's the world that you're in, you do them all the time and, you know, you just haven't paused until now to get the, to get the credential, it, it's, this stuff's going to come back easy for you. For me, I, you know, again, I have the credential, but I haven't really worked in a pulmonary function testing lab. It was stuff that I really had to kind of hit the books on. So just, just pay heed if you're, you know, if you're an exam candidate. Question 12. After bronchodilator therapy, you record the following PFT data on a 67-year-old male, COPD patient who reports frequent exacerbations of his condition. FEV1 to force vital capacity percentage 59%. FEV1 is 44% predicted. You would characterize the stage of the patient's COPD as which of the following. So this is, again, going back to this interpretation that you would absolutely expect a pretty fair amount of questions on the uh, credentialing exam on. A, mild. B, moderate. C, severe. And D, very severe. The answer is C. And the reason why is irreversible airflow obstruction is present when the FEV1 to force vital capacity ratio after bronchobilator treatment is less than 70% of predicted. The stage of COPD is then gauged by its impact on the predicted FEV1. So if the FEV1 is less than 50%, but, but, greater or equal to 30% of the patient's predicted value, and there's a history of repeated exacerbations, the stage is uh, categorized as severe, as severe. 13, while performing spirometry on a patient 
they suddenly complain to you of severe shortness of breath, some chest pain. Which of the following actions would you recommend at this time? Take a look. Call a code blue. Seems a little bit dramatic. B, call your manager. When you see that as a distractor, you know, call your supervisor, call your manager, go in the corner and cry and stuff like that. And you're like, eh, you know, a little, little, little humor, giggle to yourself. C, decrease the treadmill incline. Hmm. Potential. D, terminate the procedure, monitor the patient, notify the prescribing physician. You know, I was let the nurse know, you know, if you need to, you know, et cetera. Say monitor, respond. So of these answers, you get the idea. The best answer, the patient's not coding. Okay, we, we hope they don't get to that point. They're not coding. You're not going to call your manager. Decreasing the, 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 the incline, I mean, you may need to do that, you know, to get them off of the, off of the actual uh, treadmill. Uh, but that's an interim step. The best answer is you're going to really stay with, the, you, know, you know, get them off of the equipment safely and effectively, quickly, um, monitor them, let people know. And if obviously if they further decline, you call, do things like call an RRT. Correct, correct answer is D, the explanation. Patient response uh, responses that justify terminating a pulmonary function testing and close the patient's monitor include monitor severe angina or angina. Um, increasing nervous system symptoms such as ataxia, dizziness, is a, you know, near syncope. The patient says, I feel really lightheaded. I, you know, the, the, my eyes are getting, you know, a dim, whatever. That's certainly a sign that they're ready to, you know, ready to, to, to fall over. Again, you could you call it an RRT? It's conceivable. But in this particular case, they don't seem like they're quite there yet. Signs of poor perfusion, such as cyanosis or pallor, um, severe wheezing, uh, and dyspnea would also be included. Question 14, a key characteristic of all obstructive dis disorders is, is which of the following? Decrease in lung volumes, decrease or increase in lung volumes, B. C, decrease in flow rates. And D, decrease in work of breathing. So this should be apparent. Again, everything is you know, apparent if, you, if you're an expert at it or been doing it a while, but the correct answer is C. So you're thinking about obstructive disorders, restrictive, you have smaller uh, uh, capacities and volumes. And again, um, for obstructive, you're going to have a decrease in flow rates. And that's what this explanation is, is essentially saying. Just pausing a minute to give you a second to read it. Question 15. A patient with a history of nocturnal dyspnea has an FEV1 of 1.5 liters before bronchodilator therapy and an FEV1 of 1.8, 15 minutes after the treatment, which is the recommended you know, time that you're waiting, minimally you know, 15 minutes. These results indicate that the patient has which of the following? Which of the following? A, has airway obstruction that is unresponsive to treatment. B, is suffering from a combined obstructive and restrictive disorder. C, has at least partially reversible airway obstruction, and D is developing tolerance to the bronchodilator, looking at your various choices here. So the patient has a response, okay, they have a response. Um, it's, you know, not all that dramatic, but let's kind of look at the answer and the explanation. So C, patient at least a partially, a partially reversible airway obstruction. Percent change, we started this present, or these questions in the presentation on this, FV1 plus 20%. So you have the, you know, 1.8 minus 1.5 over 1.5. So it's 0 0.3 over 1.5. It's a 20% change. It's it's a significant change and it is looks like it's reversible that the patient does have a notable response. Question 16, which of the following spirometry tests would you recommend to evaluate the severity of an, an obstructive lung order, obstructive lung order. Kind of building on some prior questions that we've had in, in this, uh, you know, in this presentation. A, forced vital capacity. B, inspiratory capacity. C, tidal volume. And D, expiratory reserve volume. What did we say earlier? We said that you're talking about your, your obstructive patients, their problem or flows. So that, I'm tipping my hand there. A, forced vital capacity. The fake out there is, well, it's a capacity, but it is a volume slash capacity 
over time, uh, which is the very definition of flow. Volume over time is the very definition of flow. Because obstructive disorders limit airflow, the only measurement that's listed to help assess the severity of this condition would be the force vital capacity. And again, there's some additional elaboration here, which I'll give you a moment to read and we'll in a moment move on to the next question. Which of the following diagnosis is consistent with the following flow volume curve? Flow volume curve. I'll give you a hint for those. I, I think people are probably jumping all over this, but it's, you know, you need to know what's normal before you know what's abnormal. So let's take a look. A, variable intrathoracic obstruction. B, fixed extrathoracic obstruction. C, small airway obstruction. And D, normal expiratory inspiratory flow. Keep in mind, for, for those that are less familiar, the bottom portion is, is inspiration. The top is exhalation, okay? From peak flow all the way down. Let's take a look. Correct answer is D. The, the, the reason why, in a flow volume loop, the lower portion represents inhalation. As I just said, the top portion depicts exhalation. In this example, there's a rapid acceleration to normal peak expiratory flow and a steady decrease in expiratory flow to a normal volume. Inspiration has a normal symmetrical shape normal symmetrical shape. So this is a normal, if you will, flow volume loop or curve. 18, which of the choices below is consistent with this one? All right, look at the choices. A, normal forced expiratory flow pattern. So because this, this is after the, the, you know, the preceding one, kind of look at saying, eh, you know, and sometimes when you actually take a credential exam or exam in general, that some of these subsequent questions will help you, okay? Um, so this one, you've already had the luxury of seeing what a normal one is, you know it's not. So you can pretty much discount A. B, variable intrathoracic obstruction. C, airway obstruction. And D, fixed large airway obstruction. Fixed large airway obstruction. Keep in mind, fixed large airway obstruction, that's gonna have what is, has been referred to as a pancaking, okay, where the the, if you will, the expiratory side and the inspiratory side look very uh, similar. That's not the case here. Answer C, a flow volume loop, the lower portion represents inhalation, top portion represents exhalation. In this example, there's a peak expiratory flow is lower than normal and the expiratory flow is notched out and ends at the lower volume indicating an obstructive disorder. NBRC, they'll, they'll throw some curveballs at you, but they're also going to ask you stuff like this. They're going to test to see if you know kind of the basics that you can delineate between a uh, restrictive disorder and an obstructive disorder. And this would be a depiction of an obstructive disorder. Which of the following would be the uh, key components of a forced vital capacity loop? Almost like in your brain as you're ready to explain it to a patient, okay? What are you going to do? Which of this? Maximum inspiration, Blast of expiration and complete exhalation. Maximal inspiration and exhalation for at least six seconds. C, forced exhalation, exhalation for at least six seconds in adults and three seconds in children, blah, 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 younger, uh, uh, younger than 10. And D, no cough in the first second and a fast start, also known as back extrapolation. Let's take a look. A is the correct answer. That's important. Let's look at why. Key components of the forced vital capacity maneuver indicate a blast of expiration and a complete exhalation after a maximal inhalation. Last of our sample questions, the LCO measurements may be indicated to evaluate gas exchange abnormality in which of the following? Ketoacidosis, hmm. Myasthenia, now, myasthenia, patient probably has health, healthy lungs, but again, they have that, that muscle weakness. Interstitial lung disease and bronchitis. Notice they don't say chronic or acute. So you kind of scratch your head. They're looking for the best answer, folks. Best answer is C, is C. The explanation is diffusing defects are generally not seen in ketoacidosis, myasthenia, 
or bronchitis. Okay, I will tell you in severe cases of bronchitis, you know, where you have bronchitis and they have kind of elements of consolidation that are developing, you could. Okay, in this case, though, it is not the best answer. However, interstitial lung disease is characterized by lower volumes and a diffusion de defect. So it's actually, you know, kind of in that definition. The LCO is indicated to measure diffusion defect and would be indicated in this case, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Question 21. Which of the following bedside measurements require a conscious and cooperative patient? Spontaneous respiratory rate, A. Maximum expiratory pressure, B. Spontaneous tidal volume, C. And D is maximum inspiratory pressure. Correct answer is B. Vital capacity and maximum expiratory pressure measurements require that the patient be conscious and cooperative. Assuming there's a spontaneous breathing patient um, that's, that's present, you could measure an unconscious patient's spontaneous respiratory rate and tidal volume, et cetera. 22, which of the following spirometry on an adult patient um, following uh, would indicate an invalid or unacceptable test result. Again, boring stuff, but if you're gonna work in the PFT lab, if you're gonna go for that for those credentialing exams, stuff you need to know. And maybe some of you don't find it boring, honestly. Back extrapolated volume, 300 mLs, time to peak flow of 100 um, milliseconds, C, forced expiratory time greater than six seconds, and D, repeat forced vital capacities match within 150 mLs. Correct answer is A. Correct answer is A. Let's look at why. Validity checks recommend to ensure a valid patient effort include one, back extrapolated volume less than 150, two, a time to peak expiratory flow 120 milliseconds, three, a forced expiratory time greater than six seconds with the change in exhaled volume during the last uh, 0 0.5 seconds or half a second, and four, repeat. You know, all repeat FEV six values matching within 150 mLs. So let's just come down to home stretch here, finish up. Guys, when you're, if, you, if you're serious about, you know, taking this exam, what you do, pace yourself, you know, you, you know, prepare, give yourself a, a, you know, a month or two in advance, encourage your peers. If you have a group of folks that are going to, you know, take it roughly at the same time, you know, do a study group, become familiar with the exam matrix. You know, test practice uh, exams and questions. Get your hands on as many of those as possible. Get enough rest in advance. You'll be nervous. Use it as a, as a motivator. You know, you don't want to be like so nervous you just you can't think. But you know, a little bit of uh, fear and, and a little bit of nervousness can actually motivate you to study even harder, be more prepared. What not to do, underestimate the exam, get overly nervous, place too much pressure on yourself, you know, party the night before, whatever. If you're going to party, make it an early night. Day or two before, know the location, take a practice run. I did this even though it was a couple of towns over. Understand the exam parameters, number of questions, times, time allotted, et cetera. Um, when you go to these testing sites, and you guys probably know this stuff, they, you can't bring your phone in, they give you a locker, you got to, you know, they're really pretty, pretty restrictive on when, what you're doing. You're going you're gonna to know the time because it's going to give you how much time you have left. But review the MBRC website for mechanical, what I call mechanical issues screen layout, et cetera, ensure you have proper identification and don't rely on unreliable people. If you're sitting there, you're going to be in that waiting room with other people that are taking other exams that aren't, it could be the real estate exam. But if you're there with other people that are going to take the same exam and they're all like, oh, and they're trying to like, they're all, just do your thing. Just, you know, kind of get away from them and focus on, you know, that, that you're, you're as prepared as you can be for it and that you're going to sit, take it. And frankly, if you don't pass it the first time, you will take it again. That would be my best advice. You know, welcome to the club. I have failed at things in my life, and I'm sure that all of you have. Your life doesn't end with it type of deal. And I suspect that if you prepare, most or all of you would, would pass it. Test taking strategies, multiple choice. That's not a fill-in, so the correct answer is there. Uh, don't get psyched out, you know, if you get a real difficult question early on, because that's what happens sometimes. They put a couple of difficult ones early on. Don't know why, but don't change your answer unless you've misread the question or answer or have done a mathematical error. Otherwise, you know, you have stuff stored in the back of your, your brain that you don't even, you're not even realize. Don't spend too much time on any one question. You can mark the question and go back. A little bit more, you know, if you don't know the right answer, try to identify the wrong ones. 
if you don't uh, know generally your first inclination, you know, you have that this information stored in your subconscious. And if you don't know the answer, but have a hunch, go with that choice. If you don't know all of the information in a question, focus on what you do know. MBRC doesn't necessarily expect you to know every facet, you know, of the question, of the question in order to get the answer correct. Take home messages, knowledge is empowerment. You know, education credentials are pathways to knowledge. The C and the RPFT are two such credentials which can empower you, open up doors, et cetera. However, they're tough exams, require strategy and hard work to succeed. Simply put, becoming proficient at performing and interpreting PFTs takes time and effort. There are many, many resources out there. Those seeking those credentials should have, absolutely use them. These are some of those uh, resources as well. Um, and I want to thank you for this, uh, for this uh, um, participating in this presentation and hope you uh, come back to us.